Welcome to This Week in BJJ, the world's first and only live jiu-jitsu show. Brought to you by Q5 Labs. Stay alpha. Now here's your host, Budo Jake. Hey guys, welcome to a brand new episode of This Week in BJJ. I'm Budo Jake, and today is June 21st, 2013, and I'm joined with two fabulous guests, AJ Agazarm and Stefan Kesting. AJ, you've been here many times before. Yeah. Thanks for coming back. Thanks for having me. And Stefan, this is your first time down here. You had a long drive all the way from Vancouver. We are. Uh, we did. We're on a, <laughs> the extended summer road trip and started in San Francisco this morning and just spent the last 50 miles in stop and go traffic. But wow. I'm glad we made it. Everything they say about LA traffic, it's not my first time here, but every time you come here, you're reminded as to why all these stereotypes about LA traffic exist. They are <laughs> all true. And have you lived, lived, lived your whole life in uh, Vancouver? No, I've lived in Toronto and Montreal, so in different places in uh, in Canada. And then I've, I've, you know, I've spent months abroad in the States, you know, either in Alaska or in Florida, your home turf. Hmm. Very nice. So, yeah. We're time. in Florida. Oh, that was in the uh, in the Lakes area, in the oh. Lakes District. We were just in the previous life yeah. as a biologist. We were doing biological research. So Very nice. I had to get a down payment for a house somehow. So I went abroad <laughs> for a month and, and worked my ass off uh, to... Uh, That's awesome. To, we're now most people know you as being a very co- accomplished jiu-jitsu instructor. You put out lots of DVDs and online training courses. Uh, do you do anything else to uh, to pay the bills? <laughs> well, uh, a lot of people don't know this, but I'm actually a full-time firefighter in uh, in the Vancouver area, and that's a career I've been doing for about 15 years. I wow. really, I really still enjoy it. If I didn't enjoy it, I would leave. It. Uh, it provides a little bit of stability from the feast and famine of the jiu-jitsu instruction world. Yeah. And, it, you know, at the end of the day, not every single day. It's not like, you know, Rescue Me or or these movies where it's one continuous explosion. Yeah. But you occasionally go home and you go, okay, today I did some good in the world. So, yeah, that's my, my main other gig. Right. One of the greatest things about being a firefighter is that, you know, I'm sure you have, like, maybe one day on, two days off. We don't quite have it that good. Yeah. It's... Uh, we have a four on four off schedule, so depending how busy your last night is, yeah. You know, if your last if your night shifts were busy, then it becomes more like a five and three. But even yeah. that's a lot better than the daily grind. So one of my friends down in Florida, he's a firefighter as well. He's only 21, 22 years old, and he just he loves. He works probably I think eight or nine days out of the month, and the rest he just trains and does whatever. That's awesome. So it's really very conducive for the jujitsu lifestyle. Mm-hmm. It actually works out to more than 40 hours a week, but because you're working the night shifts yeah. and it's, it's more condensed. So it's oh. like, you know, the people who take five days a week and jam it into four. But yeah, it is. If That's why there's so many firefighters who are still doing active sports in their 30s, 40s, and 50s when really most grown adults in the real world, <laughs> jujitsu not being a major exception to the real world, are still actively doing some kind of sport I don't think it gets any more real than being a firefighter. No. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it uh, you get to deal with the occasional emergency, and it's good for adre- adrenaline control. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. so at the f- this is the first time on this show that we have three black belts sitting oh. here. All right. oh. AJ and I uh, <laughs> both got promoted uh, uh, a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Well, congratulations on that. I heard about yours. I didn't Thank hear you. about yours. Thank you. Very much. Thank, Thank you. you. How have you been adapting to that uh, <laughs> new color around your belt? It's. I think the, the oddest thing... That's just kind of me is getting more adapted to this is people calling me professor. <laughs> used to be, hey, AJ, hey, coach, hey, what's going on? Right. And now it's professor every time I'm like, oh, sorry. Right. I'm dealing with the same thing. <laughs> like at, at the Gracie Baja headquarters, there's probably a, a, on any given day five to ten black belts on the mat. So I'll hear someone say, hey, professor, and like, <laughs> ten guys turn around <laughs> to look. <laughs> I told you this, I, but when I had first, after my first promotion, we would train the next day or the following day. And I'd grab my gi and my belt. I had grabbed my brown belt and was putting it on. And the guy's like, AJ, you're, you're a black belt. And I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> have, you guys, have you guys enjoyed the big bullseye that comes with a belt promotion flat on your back as everybody starts gunning for it? Yeah, you can tell people, you know, I remember being a lower belt when I would go against a new black belt. Yeah. You know, nothing's better than being able to, to beat a black belt, right? So yeah. that's true. There's a little more pressure. How long did it take you guys? It took me eight years. Eight years? It took, started in 2006. So seven years. Seven years. But you train harder. <laughs> <laughs> Did two or three days. Two or three a days. But, uh, you know, that all that, that talk people have about, like, once you get your black belt, you know, things things change a lot. And they really do. You know, even when I'm training and I'm rolling, I, I, I can see a much different perspective. And, you know, maybe it was a difference of a day or 
you know, I was one day, I was a brown belt, the next day I was a black belt. But there's just something that happens, I don't know whether it's, you know, in your mind or, you know, subconsciously, you just, something, the, the switch just changes. Yeah. And when you approach things on the mat with, you know, I think that perspective, it just, you know, things are different. And it's, uh, it's really cool. I agree. Things, I didn't think things would change, but they do. And for example, yeah. You now know the answer to everything. 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 I know it all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll be giving advice to lower belts. And uh, and they'll really listen intently. Whereas yeah. last month they might listen only you know, yeah. halfway. But just the color of the belt, they mm-hmm. take your words more seriously. That's what I had thought. I, I think maybe you know it's not going to change. You know this damn brown belt tomorrow, we're black belt. Okay, you know, how much is going to change in a day? But it, it's that it just it's a light switch that you know you, you wrap the belt around your waist and you're like, it's real now. You know it's stepping up. I think a lot of times I think for for me at least it was just it you know mentally brought me to that next level mm-hmm. you know you kind of you know flatline for a while and then you just you just climb back up yeah but the thing it doesn't stop and doesn't change is learning yeah right. still so for much. sure Stefan how long did it take you to get your black belt I think it was nine years mm-hmm. at, uh, give, or, give or take a little bit mm-hmm. so and, and who did you get it from from Marcus Suarez mm-hmm. uh, who's now I think an eighth degree black belt under Carlson Gracie so it's mm-hmm. very much like Carlson Gracie Lineage. So I shouldn't even be having this conversation with you, being as you're the mortal enemy. <laughs> um, but we'll, we'll, as long as we don't tell anybody oh, that we're having this conversation. It's, it's just between us. Okay. Correction. Yes. There's no enemies in jujitsu. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there are no friends, only accomplices. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's funny, the day that I got my jujitsu black belt, it was, uh, I think it was 2006, 2007, New Year's Eve day, I'm coming home. And I lived at the time, I lived in this condo complex. And I go into it, and a bunch of the, the grown adults there, like hiding at the gate, going, Oh my God, what are they doing? And I'm like, What's going on? And I look, and there's a couple homeless guys in the bushes that are right outside the complex going through a woman's purse. And I'm like, Well, what's going on? Well, we think they've stolen a purse. And then they've got some piece of stereo equipment as well. And it's like, Okay, have you guys called the cops? Yeah but it's New Year's Eve day, the cops are busy. Everyone's gone. <laughs> Everyone's gone, and they're taking forever to respond. So I was like, okay, well, we'll wait for the cops, we'll do the right thing. And then one guy takes off, and it's like, okay, we're at least gonna catch one of these. So I, I go out, and I talk to the other guy, and I'm fairly confident in my abilities to control one middle-aged, probably drug addict. You know, I don't wanna get blood on me, I think mm-hmm. I can handle this. You know, it's probably not gonna have a gun, you might have a knife. I still think I'm okay. And I was like, you know, you're staying here, buddy. The cops are coming. Well, I, and lots of profanity ensues. I don't want to give you like an R rating on this this <laughs> video mm-hmm. to give you the blow by blow transcript. So eventually, we agree that he's going to stay there, or I force him to stay. And now his friend comes back, and I'm in a weird position now because I'm pretty again pretty confident in my ability. I'm I'm bigger than they are. I'm stronger than they are. I'm in the prime of my life. I just got my black belt. I'm invulnerable. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and now I'm trying to keep two guys there. And again, I could probably knock them both out pretty quickly. I could probably break both their arms fairly quickly. But to simply stop them from running away, mm. that's a whole not- It turns into this extended half hour long tussle. One guy running away, going and grabbing him. The other guy running away, trying to pr- run over to where a video camera is and then trying to verbally provoke me so that I hit him <laughs> in front of the Jeez. video camera. These guys were were pros, and so this—that's—that's that's my recollection of getting my black belt. This gigantic, hour-long schmozzle. It wasn't right. even a, a street fight. <laughs> Just call it a, a gong show. <laughs> trying to not kill these guys on camera, mm-hmm. and you know, just trying to keep two guys there. Right. So, it, uh, in retrospect, I should have. And all my brave neighbors who told me afterwards, "Oh, I'd never been in a conflict in my entire life. <laughs> I couldn't intervene." Man. There's two guys there. One of them could have pulled a knife out and stabbed me. Like, yeah. how about coming down and standing there for moral support? But I guess we take yeah. some level of aggression or conflict or dealing with aggressive energy for granted. You know, we're, we're dealing with guys for the most part, or even the girls are trying to take our arms off or choke us unconscious. Yeah. And so, you know, it does give you some confidence in, you know, in real life. Right. In Absolutely. a self-defense situation, even though this whole argument, like, Oh, what if you're using your jiu-jitsu in a street that's covered with syringes and broken <laughs> glass? 
First of all, there aren't that many streets covered in syringes and broken glass. Mm. And the real beauty of jiu-jitsu is that being able to deal with that in-your-face energy. Yeah. I think when it comes to self-defense, just somebody you know, hyperventilating in front of you. Yeah. It's like, well, oh, I've been here before. Right. I mean, it's definitely a different perspective. Maybe I shouldn't pull guard. <laughs> maybe the brimbolo's out. <laughs> <laughs> My number one go-to move in a self-defense situation. Pull Delahiva and go for the brimbolo. Below. Joking. I haven't heard it that way yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of uh, street fight situations, we got a video that was posted on YouTube recently. And uh, you never know who knows jujitsu out there, especially when you're driving. Uh, but these guys, uh, one of them did. Let's take a look <laughs> at the clip. These guys are fighting. <laughs> I got the whole thing on video. Wow, who would have guessed if someone would take someone's back and... <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> and he had one hook in, so he knew a little bit of what he was doing. <laughs> well, I, again, I, not to diss the homeless people of Vancouver, but I knew that jiu-jitsu had really gone mainstream when I saw a couple of homeless guys fighting, and, you know, one guy was going for, I think, the guillotine from the guard. Mm. And, you know, I, and I've seen video clips of, you know, just young punks fighting, and uh, I think it's hard to underestimate the extent to which the UFC has influenced street fighting. I mean, there was yeah. a day when if you and I were fighting and I kicked you, that was playing dirty. I'm, I'm old enough to remember, like, it's okay to punch somebody in the schoolyard, but if you kick them, you're really playing dirty. Yeah. Bruce Lee comes along, oh, then it's the coolest thing you can do, right? right. If you kick me in the face, everyone's like, wow, that was a really <laughs> good move. <laughs> Total change overnight. But at that time, okay, Bruce Lee came along to, you know, double leg somebody, you know, to jump on their back and choke them. That would have been so completely removed. Yeah. And now it's par for the course. I, I, I think I was talking about this. I forget who I was talking about this with. It'll come to me in a second. But uh, a friend of mine is a sheriff, and they had to change their pat-down procedures, you know, when you put the hands against the wall, because the guys were starting to go for rolling knee bars. It was, I think, Keenan Cornelius who was, huh. I was talking about this with. Guys were starting to go for rolling knee bars up against, you know, from the, the frisking position. Hmm. So this is probably from guys who've never done a rolling knee bar in their life. Right. So it, it, there's a trickle-down effect here for sure. Funny. Well, we got a lot of things to talk about. We're going to talk about Metamorphs 2, Jiu-Jitsu Battle, and uh, some interesting news from Gary Tonin. So don't go anywhere. Let's check out the news. So Metamorphs 2 just took place a couple weeks ago, and uh, you guys probably all saw the first one, right? Yeah. The first one was, was pretty cool. There was, um, you know, they had a 20-minute format, so you got to see much longer matches, uh, some interesting guys fighting. The second one looked great on paper. There's a lot of big names, but most people agree that it underdelivered. AJ, you were there watching live. What did you think? Yeah, uh, like you said, the production of the event was completely, you know, Breathtaking! It was an awesome event. It was almost at a you know a UFC production level of entertainment, and you know you had, you're actually in the arena. And they had music, you know, live music playing, just lots of lights and and awesomeness, and um, they they really did an awesome job, of, you know, at presenting the event. Um, some of the fight matchups, when you first look at it, you're like, man, this is going to be epic. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times in in what we see in jujitsu is the clash of styles. And it, um, you know, with the change in the rules versus people that are normally accustomed to IBJJF rules and people that then go into the submission only mentality, um, you know, things changed. Things were different. Yeah. Um, you could tell that there was sort of like a stigma that, that some of the competitors had. I don't know, um, but things were different. It was it was a little bit a little bit weird to watch. Um, there was only one submission. Yeah. In the entire event, there was. I think six fights. Yep. 
So one, one of one of six was a submission, and and I know that the change in this uh, metamorphosis versus the change uh, versus the first metamorphosis is that there was there was judges. Mm -hmm. Because the problem with Minamorris 1 was, I believe it was three out of the six matches ended in a draw. Nobody right. likes to see a draw. You want to see one guy win and one guy lose. Right. And so the second one, they said, okay, we're going to have judges this time. And what happened? Well, they, let me, let me play ask. to the judges. Yeah. Yes, but the rules were such that if two judges disagreed, the third one wouldn't change it. It'd be a draw. So there was two or three draws. Yeah, but let me ask you this. If, if you, unless there's a submission, what is the difference if, it, if, it, if the guy gets his hand raised or not? Everybody wants there to be a champ. Yeah, but if the, if the guy has clearly dominated the other person, then why why does it matter? You mean they should be the winner if they dominated? Yeah, yeah. So if they don't, and then it's just that close of a match, is it? It's not even that entertaining, right? Um, that with throwing the judges on, I know that they recently made the decision to. So they made the decision to put the judges on, and now they have the decision to retract the judges. Mm -hmm. And I think some of their mentality behind that, and this is just from watching some of the videos that they had just recently put out after the event with Halleck speaking about the um, some of the decisions that they made. But when you have the judges, you don't want to give up any kind of like position. You, you're very like more, more, you know, conservative. Conservative is yeah. a good way to put it. Exactly. And you're, you're you're not really more thinking about submission. You're really more thinking about you know, am I putting myself in a bad position for the judges to give him the upper hand if it does fall down to a decision? So now they're leaning more towards, well, this submission is getting really difficult. I'm probably not going to find myself getting a submission here. But if I make my sh make sure that I am keeping myself at a bad position and maybe I get a sweep or a mount or pass the guard once or twice, maybe a takedown, I could get the ref's decision. Right. And that mentality is, I think this is what the metamorphs is really trying to steer away from. They want to breed the type of fighters that are... Do or die. Yeah. Do you know if they were offering a cash incentive? There was you, a submission bonus. From do you know how time. much it was? No. Because that, you know, eventually they're going to offer, I'm going to give you a million dollars if you finish. Right. Okay, cool. Right. Yeah. It, uh, I was talking about that with some of my friends. I had said, you know, if they give them only a, an X amount, a small amount of dollars to fight and then an exponential amount more to, to get the submission, I think you'll see <laughs> right. a big difference versus splitting maybe 10 and 10 or yeah. 5 and 5. I think Minamorse's theory is that a submission only, oh, let me take that back, a no points longer match is going to be more exciting than a 10 minute point match that we see in IBGF. That's the theory. And in this event, it didn't work out that way. So I think the, the challenge is going to be how do you motivate the guys not to stall, not to be conservative, and a bigger bonus for the submission would be one way. Well, Metamorphs 1 was quite exciting. Yep. I, mean, I was at ringside. Yep. And I saw you there. Yep. I was sitting right beside a couple of the machados. It was, it was an awesome event. Yep. So maybe maybe the judges is. Yeah, I think that they, they, they're killed the judges. Yeah, th they're they're thinking that maybe that was some of the reasons why behind people were being a little bit more conservative. But you know, <clears throat> I, I, Meta Morris's theory is is really they just want to bring jujitsu to an elevated level. They want to bring it to the mainstream, um, and it's difficult when you have situations like this. So mm -hmm. a lot of times it's, you know conditioning the fighters in a way that they're more entertaining yeah um i'm sure the ufc deals with it as well yeah you know that's right well this is something that you know other sports have dealt with in the past and for example you take a look at judo mm -hmm. um where they've essentially micromanaged the sport into oblivion but the whole rationale is to make it an exciting sport for for television and for yeah. for spectators but really what they've done is they've added so many rules of like you can grip here you can't grip there you can't do this you can't do that that it's really stifled the evolution of the sport and really punished some people who've gone down some avenues in judo you know leg picks the leg pick experts gone gone yeah you have to appreciate you know some of the things that went on with metamorphs you know it, it is it is bringing elevation to the sport for some of us that you know Anybody who practices jiu-jitsu, I feel like they're always enthusiastic about the sport. They're always like, this is an awesome thing. I'm so glad I'm involved with it. So Meta Morris is elevating the sport of jiu-jitsu tremendously. Um, the, you know, the, the types of fighters that they bring in, like there was a lot of big controversy about Brennan Schwab. Mm -hmm. Well, from the Halleck video, I don't know if anybody's ever seen, if anybody's seen it yet, Halleck released a video post the Meta Morris talking about just the event as a whole and there some of the decisions that they made and some of the things that they're going to do going forward. We'll show that video in a minute, by the way. Okay. 
So the um, decision that, you know, with Brendan Schwab, Brendan Schwab really gave the fans something to boo. Yeah. And we're going to talk about each match. So maybe before we get into it too much, let's just start off with the first match. This was Victor Estima, brother of Braulio Estima, versus JT Torres. Now, both of these guys were amazing, uh, have amazing jiu-jitsu. But something happened when they were matched up together. They were a little conservative. They're both playing 50-50 a lot, and not a lot happened. So that match ended in a draw. The next one is uh, Michelle Nicolini versus Mackenzie Dern. And uh, these girls have fought before, both very game competitors. Uh, Dern is a relatively new black belt. And most people thought that Nicolini w- had the advantage in this one, but Dern came out with a fast toe hold right at the beginning. And a lot of people think this was the most exciting match of the event. Yeah, there was definitely a lot of action in that event. Mm-hmm. In that match. Which I actually haven't seen this this match. It's awesome so far. Yeah. Great for yeah. them on uh, you know pushing women's jiu-jitsu in this direction. It's interesting to see how they deal with uh, reaping. Uh, I would imagine this replay is in fast mode. Or no. they're really going that they're fast. They're really going that fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, lots of leg attacks in this match. Bloody small people. <laughs> Always moving fast. <laughs> It seems like it is in fast forward, but they're <laughs> moving that fast. Yeah. Mackenzie's smart at keeping that other grip so she doesn't get uh, to hold on too well. So this match went the whole distance, 20 minutes, but uh, as you can see, very little stalling. They're both going for it. How was the crowd's reaction? Enthusiastic. So you have a difference. Wow. You have a difference here. Obviously, that you know you have these two type of fighters mm-hmm. versus Victor and 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 JT's match. Um, you know, maybe the the judges were more of a impact for them in their style, but it didn't appear to be that. So in this case, yeah, yeah, this one too goes the distance and ends in the draw. And again, that's not uh, to put down either one of them. They both fought their hearts out. It's just that they're so evenly matched. So once again, the discussion comes back to the 50-50 and what should you do about it. I, I, uh, on the way down here, I was thinking, well, maybe there should be an exception. You're not allowed to heel hook in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu except if you're in the 50-50. <laughs> or maybe you've been in the 50-50 for longer than 50 seconds. Or <laughs> then, then you should be allowed to go full bore for the heel hook. It would change the, uh, the position significantly. Right. In the gi, I don't know. That's, that's a lot of friction. But in no gi... Sure, it, it, you see it all the time in ADCC. It mm-hmm. speeds up the matches. Next matchup was uh, the most controversial one of all: Cyborg versus Brandon Schaub. And um, I think uh, Schaub did a great disservice to the fans and to Metamorphs in general. You know, you, you do see guys stalling once in a while in uh, IBJF events or any other event. Those are events where guys are not getting paid. Brandon's being paid very well here to to compete to put on a show. And he was very, uh, he was not engaging and uh, wasn't there to grapple. It's not even that he was not engaging. He was fleeing. Yeah. A lot of times he was fleeing. And, and I, I thought about this for a while. I thought about this matchup. And I, I've been around Cyborg long enough to know kind of the type of person he is. And, you know, he, he's very dangerous in a lot of positions. And, and Brennan, you know, from the discussion that Halleck had on the video, was that Brendan approached Meta Morris guys about being a fighter on the on the event, on the card. And he was enthusiastic about it, and maybe in their minds they thought, yeah, this guy doesn't really stand a chance mm-hmm. uh, against Cyborg. And, um, but, you know, it's, it's bringing in a whole different side to help heighten the, you know, the event itself. Right. He's... You know, Brennan Schwab is attached with the, the UFC side of things on the jiu-jitsu community, which if you think about it from a promoter standpoint, if you think about it from an event standpoint, it would be great to have something like that attached to your event because you're bringing in, uh, you know, other people from the different industry within the same community, right. but to support. And I, I think that's what Lennon Morris was, was kind of seeing is that, you know, this guy was very enthusiastic about being able to fight on the event. He wanted to fight um, Cyborg. You know, Cyborg, you know, he, he's definitely one of the best. And 
um, they probably thought, what's the worst that could happen? Right. <laughs> this um, is the worst that could happen. <laughs> right. But UFC guys have represented themselves quite well in submission grappling before. Mm -hmm. uh, Randy Couture mm -hmm. fought in several events. Uh, that was at Pro something or other mm -hmm. years ago. Yeah. In The Ultimate Fighter uh, Season 1, when in, after they'd finished filming the show, but before they'd aired the finale, I believe those guys weren't allowed to fight MMA for quite a long time. So you had guys like Nate Quarry and Chris mm -hmm. Lieben competing in jiu-jitsu tournaments. Yeah, Ben Henderson still competes. Yeah, so yeah. this is not a, sl a slam on all MMA guys right. at, at any... Yeah, and I see their angle of putting him in, which is smart, but what I don't like is after this match, uh, you can see Brennan looks happy, and he even said he considers it a victory mm -hmm. to have not been submitted by Cyborg. And that's not his job. Right. The job is not to run away. The job is to grapple. It's a grappling tournament. The right. equivalent would be me agreeing to have a tennis match against Roger Federer and there being a, a loophole in the rules saying I never have to serve the ball. Yeah. And just standing there for six hours until night falls with yeah. the ball saying I'm not going to serve you. Nah, nah. Right. I consider this a draw. I Come on. Yeah. Well, The commentator had came up and he had said, well, you know, had said to the crowd, what would you do if you were grappling Cyborg? Grapple would be yeah. one thing I would choose. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but um, I, this really, you know, it goes back to the mindset, of, mindset of the fighters. When you think about MMA guys, and the, most of the, some guys, top level jujitsu athletes that compete on a regular basis in the in the gi and with the, without the gi, but they don't do MMA, and then they roll with guys that are involved in MMA, but they have kind of a jujitsu understanding in the background. It's totally different. Mm -hmm. You know, we were, you know, we were doing some rolling with some MMA, MMA guys the other day. Um, and there's a big difference. And I think this goes back to the mindset. You guys were talking about Brendan having a big smile on his face and him considering this a win. Um, I, I, I think that, you know, the community needs to be more supportive of what, in fact, we like as fans, what we like as spectators, and what exactly Metamorphosis is enabling us to be able to be more, um, to view more, which is fighting. Uh, not, not fighting, but in, you know, Competition. Competition. Well, keeps everybody you knows going at it. the fans want to see action, right? Yeah. And nobody is thinks that the fans want to see stalling or running away. But I would hope that the, that that Morris would tell their fighters, you know what, guys, yeah. we're putting on a show. This is not just a grappling tournament. This is show. This is entertainment. You guys got to go there and fight your hearts out, or you won't be back. Yeah. Who cares about points? Who cares about position? Who cares about anything else? Just go out there, give it your all, and you know, let let everybody enjoy that. Yeah. That's. You know, if I go back to the Kumite, that's exactly what I, I thought when I entered the Kumite. I'm, there's nothing for me to hold back. I don't right. care if, you know, one guy beats me or one guy doesn't beat me. I'm going to get to go there and, and put some of my stuff. I wasn't in the best condition I was, right. could be, but I just went out there and had fun. Right. And we, we we all put on some awesome matches for people to watch. Yep, and who cares if you win or lose? I mean, it's cool if you win, but <laughs> if Brandon would have got submitted in the first 30 seconds, so what? You know, props for you for getting out there and doing it. Yeah. Nobody would have respected him any less. I don't that's think. the confused theory I think he had. He thought, just like you said, he, he thought it would be a win if he came out unsubmitted right. versus if he came out there and gave it his all and, and it was submitted, it would be more appealing to us as fans. Right. There's this guy that's in the MMA, he's in the UFC, he doesn't train regularly with a gi. He came out here and attacked one of the best guys. Yeah. And he gave it his all and you know he was submitted, but props to him. Yeah. Next matchup was Andre Galvao versus Rafael Lovato Jr. Uh, g both of these guys were in Metamorphosis 1. Mm -hmm. uh, Galvao fought a, a super aggressive match against uh, Huron Gracie in Metamorphosis 1, and he was just as intense in this one. I was glad to see that uh, Galvao didn't change his style. He was attacking the whole time, and Lovato is always a game competitor. But uh, Galvao just looked a little bit sharper in this match. One, two... Did did Cyborg compete in Worlds? Worlds, yeah. He didn't make it to the finals, though. One, two. So, AJ, you were there. What did you think of this match? This is definitely a, a high-paced match. Yeah. Very intense. Both guys are super intense. Both of them are absolute warriors. Mm -hmm. They're from all their other competition. It just doesn't seem to be any different. Yep. Uh, Lovato is... Uh, Probably the the best American grappler that's uh, currently competing at the highest levels. That was a nice takedown. Yeah, Gavao had some nice sweeps, nice takedowns. Great submission attempts. How long is it before somebody gets really seriously hurt by getting pile drivered off that stage? I think that's a security concern. Absolutely. Yeah. 
And the thing is, there's no, there's nobody around to help you if you fall off. Like you think about the old pride days, there's the guys <laughs> in the ring that, on the side that'll push you back in. We're going to see a little, a match later where uh, somebody else pushes someone in, but uh, I think they should either lower that mat or have someone on the side to, uh, We'll do an American Gladiator style. Oh, nice armbar <laughs> attempt. Yeah. American Gladiator style with huge uh, crash mats on either side. Right. It, you know, here's a good example of Andre Galvon. Is is just it looks like he's just going after it. You yeah. know, he doesn't really care about positions that may be lost. And a lot of times, if you were to see that armbar attempt that he just went for, you you normally only see those kind of things in in training or if the guys really feel that he has a confident secured position mm -hmm. to try it in an IBJJF match because it is timed and there is points. Yep. So I think, you know, that's kind of the style that we really are more in, in you know. Yep. He embodies the submission only fighter. That's what people want to see. Yeah. Next matchup was Braulio Estima versus Rodolfo Vieira. This is a match that on paper looked amazing. <laughs> Braulio is arguably um, one of the guys with the best guards in the game, and uh, Rodolfo is one of the guys with the best passing. So it was a really interesting question of can the best passer beat the best guard? And uh, unfortunately, Braulio is injured. You can see tape on his right hand, and he does very little with his right hand. He wasn't able to be very aggressive, and uh, Rodolfo does end up passing way late in the match. Brawler has a pretty unique guard position here. What's he call that, AJ? The guard of the galaxies. <laughs> a funky name, but uh, yeah, he's using the, uh, you can see the end of the... Spider guard on the, uh, the, on the lapel. Spider of the gi. Yeah. Yeah, a more fitting name would be coattail guard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like that name better. But he prevents, you know, the best passer uh, from passing a long time. But in the end... Yeah. Yeah. Do you think some of these outcomes of these matches would have been a little bit different had the IBJJF tournament not been so close? Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, Vic, going back to Victor and JT, um, I, I don't mean to talk those guys down, being that they, there wasn't a lot of activity in the match. They both got notice of that match so late. Uh, There's a scheduling conflicts with some other guys, so they didn't have a lot of time to prepare. And like you say, AJ, they both did the Worlds just the week before, which is a huge undertaking. And um, and so did uh, Bradley Van Adolfo. So seven of the 12, was it? Something like that. Seven of the twelve were in the in the tournament the weekend before. Right. And you know the lay the layman might not know how much goes in to prepare for the worlds, but it's a huge undertaking. It's not just a day of competition. There's weeks and months of training that go up to that, and to finish that, and then the very next week compete again. Right, and I think that's one of the things that were, was kind of interesting is because you know when you think about a training camp, okay, so they're training for the worlds, but the training can coincide for both that and that, but the the tournaments following the, the the world tournament, which is you know the, the highest stages of competition, mm -hmm. um, and it's not just one match like they have here. It's four, five, six matches. And I don't think it's a physical recovery thing because these guys have wars in training too. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's got to be a hormonal, adrenal, complete fatigue by the yeah. end of the worlds. Uh, regardless of whether you win or lose, you're yeah. done. You and a lot of these guys cut yeah. weight to get to the, sure. you know for the worlds, and then then you want to eat <laughs> after that, and then yeah. you have to cut again. Yeah. And it makes it very difficult when you have your friends and everybody's in town and they're all celebrating after Worlds and you're like, oh, well, I have a, another tournament in the weekend. Right. Now, it's here's a, something that I didn't like about this match. Right at the end, Braulio gets a knee bar and he has it fully extended. It looks like it's on. The time is up and they stopped it. Now, according to uh -huh. the rule changes, if there was a submission locked in and the match was over, the match would keep going until the guy taps or he escapes. That was the way I understood the rule changes before Metamorphs too, and they didn't follow that. That was a fully applied knee bar. Right. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if the referees just weren't aware of the rule changes. Mm -hmm. I don't know how, since the spectators were. But it's like not being uh, saved by the count mm -hmm. in yep. boxing. Yeah. yeah. You know, everything's going to go through. It's it's you know it's squeaks and changes and. I think just let's be supportive of whatever it is that changes. You know, they're going to... Yeah, they'll figure it out. Yeah. yeah. Last match of the day was Shinya Aoki, who's uh, one of the best grapplers in Japan. He competes a lot in MMA. He also did some submission grappling tournaments, such as the Budo Challenge and ADCC before, taking on Hickson's son, Krohn Gracie. Aoki is a judo and jiu-jitsu black belt, so we saw some nice stand-up, some good throw attempts. How did you feel about this matchup? I thought it was an excellent matchup. I was, the, you know, it's the main event, and it was the one that I was most interested because they're both submission hunters. Yeah. And the stylistic differences between the uh, 
the, the I'll say more shoot wrestling mm -hmm. uh, style of going for the submission, you know, like a like a leg lock or a flying arm bar or yeah. those uh, weird armpit arm bars from standing. Yeah, you can see Crone positional game. Crone locks up a guillotine quick. He has one of the best guillotines in jiu jitsu. Almost submitted Marcelo Garcia, the last ADCC, and uh, Alki was in trouble. He escaped once, and it looks like he was about to escape the second time, but he falls off. Now Crone's getting it locked in. The ref puts his hands on him, tell him to stop, and a guy from the crowd comes up and supports Aoki's <laughs> legs. Yeah, this was one thing that was very strange to me. Yeah. Because, you know, you understand, like, I, I go through it in competition all the time. You know, when even when I'm training, if we're getting close to the wall or if we're getting close to the edge of the mat, you know, your, your, your tendency is to kind of let up and let you hear the ref say, but it seemed like in this situation that Kron kept going. Yep. Then the ref said, it was evident, the ref said stop. Mm -hmm. He even put his hands on them. But then they, they let it be as a, as, a, as a submission, which was very strange because I, th I think, you know, when you have the guy from outside the mat interfering with the fight, I think that changes things. It, absolutely. He would have fallen off. Yeah. And, and the guy was, was propping him up. I don't know who this guy was or if he was a friend of yeah, uh, Crohn's or what. Nobody but he's just trying to stop two guys from rolling off the, this elevated platform and hurting themselves. But that's not his play. Nobody what if knows. he would have grabbed an ankle and pulled, you know, would sure. that, would he have <laughs> stopped him? Yeah. <laughs> Pro wrestling. Right. Or MMA in Brazil. It was really, really weird. Right. And the thing is, is that it resulted in the end of the match. Yep. You know. We, when you had said that he had gotten out of the submission and then got put back in it, look when he put back in it. The, the line was drawn. He stepped outside the line, so he probably thought in his mind, okay, we're, we're going to restart here in a second, so I might, I'll be fine. You know, that's a, maybe a competitor error or whatever, what, you know, what have you. But the ending was just really weird. Right. I don't want to take anything away from Crone. He's an awesome competitor. He has a, one of the best guillotines ever, and I don't know if the match would have been any different. Otherwise, yeah, it would have been um, nice to see some more. It, right, it was just a <laughs> bummer to end like that. Crone's post-fight comment, if I recall correctly, was something like he knew that Aoki doesn't give his opponents any slack at all, and when you take a look at the, the, the limbs that have been mangled and completely yeah. dislocated by Aoki, it's not like he applies an armbar and waits for the tap. He applies the armbar trying to rip the thing out of its right. socket. Right. So fair enough. He was if Aoki doesn't give any slack on his submissions, why should he give any slack on his? And I, I. I'm in complete agreement with Crone. Yeah. Why, why should you let up until right. the referee's told you exactly. a couple of times? Yep. The ref said stop. Right. And they went and they let it be ending as a submission. Right. So maybe, you know, even when when, when Aoki said, he said in the interview, I, I tap because the ref said stop. Isn't mm -hmm. that what he had said in the interview? I didn't see Aoki's. I didn't hear I just that. saw Crone's. But yeah, let me be clear. It's not the competitor's job to stop until the ref tells him to. So yeah. the fact that Crone kept it going, that's his job. He did have his face down. He might not have been aware of exactly everything that was going on, but um, he was doing what he was supposed to do. But I'm not sure if, it, from the camera angle, it looks like the ref puts his hand on both guys, tells him to stop and restart. Now he could clearly see because he had his back. Before he had the submission, exactly. as he had the submission, but before he tapped, yep. the ref told him. <laughs> I think there was a verbal and hands on. Right. So that was, that was interesting. I think we need to see a rematch of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So um, there's been a lot of uh, discussion about Metamorphs 3. I think the fans, uh, for the most part, were, were disappointed. And um, Halleck addressed some of those concerns on a press conference. Let's take a look. What we learned from Metamorphs 2 was the idea of preventing somebody from holding a grip or not stepping into action or keeping action going in the match. You know, if you're a top-level jiu-jitsu competitor, or athlete, you shouldn't be concerned about being pretty much in any position, you know, in, in a match, and you shouldn't be concerned about having to approach the match or having to get side mounted or get, you know, um, anything. You know, you shouldn't be con as concerned about that as you would about just as much as much as you would about g achieving a sweep or achieving a submission or taking an opportunity that somebody gives you with a mistake that they make. What we're going to do is, is bring in a rule where you cannot hold a grip or prevent the action uh, it, to any extended period of time to which it becomes obvious that you're not doing anything with that action or with that grip to progress or to create something um, in the match that will ultimately be more advantageous to you. Um, and if you don't do that, that you're going to get a warning 
And then the second warning is going to be a yellow card. And maybe we'll take a percentage of, of the purse of one of the athletes or whoever the violator is. So for me, in, in bringing Brennan Schaub in, he approached me from the very beginning with so much enthusiasm saying, hey, you know, uh, Cyborg would be perfect to be the perfect opponent. He chose his opponent. He was so adamant about being in the event, making it happen, that I believe, like, man, this is honorable. You know, he's a brown belt. Like, wow, he's willing to go in there and worst case, get caught in a submission. And I thought, man, how cool is that? That he's willing to put himself on the line as a UFC fighter. And that could be like something really cool for other UFC fighters to see and, and respect and everything. And so that plan just went completely, you know, out the window and, and in a whole different direction. So for that, I apologize. You know, that wasn't my intention. My intention was worst case scenario. He goes in there and gets caught by Cyborg, but he's honorable and he approaches it in a way that, you know, people can learn from and there's nothing wrong with going in there and getting caught and tapping out and, and continuing the, the journey, you know? So the most exciting thing for me on Metamorphs 3 was not any of the matches that took place, but the announcement they made for the main event at Metamorphs 3. It's going to be a rematch of Eddie Bravo versus Hoyler Gracie. It's been 10 years now, I think, uh, almost yeah. to the day that they uh, fought, and um, nobody knew who Eddie Bravo was at that time, yeah. and uh, he submitted Hoyler and ADCC and, of course, made a big name for himself. So they tried to set up this rematch many times, and it looks like it's finally going to happen. Yeah. Um, what do you guys think is going to happen in this match? It was interesting how the, the match was, was presented because it was in the, as you were in the event, they were playing a, a promo clip. People didn't know that there was going to be a fight about it, so they were thinking, they were, they were promo promoing a clip like it was the two fighters getting ready to enter the octagon or two fighters getting ready to enter the, the ring. Um, which they were doing for all the other fights. So when you did that, and everybody in the audience was like, well, I just saw Hal I just saw Ho a Hoyler, and I just saw Eddie Bravo. There's no way they're fighting, so w what's going on? Mm -hmm. You thought they were just going to come out there and maybe do like a demonstration thing. Um, but then the ball dropped, and they're like, boom, we're going to fight each other in the next Metamorphs 3, which is going to be in October. Um, so then that's everybody was like, what? Mm -hmm. But 10 years, uh, did you see the fight between... Eddie Bravo and Hoyler. Of course. And what was really strange is that so Eddie went on to beat Hoyler, but he didn't win the, the tournament. And he got destroyed his next match against Leo Vieira. Yeah. And the commentators at the event, Metamorris, um, Henner, or I think it was Halleck, had said, you know, you basically made a career <laughs> off of beating my, my cousin or uncle, whatever it was. And, and he's like, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> and, but, you know, we got to put this in perspective. Back then, Hoyler had never been submitted in competition before. Yeah. And the Gracie name is still, you know, a very strong name. But even back then, just the mystique, um, it was a huge accomplishment for a brown belt at that time. But nonetheless, it was in the triangle position. Yeah, that's right. I promise that if I beat Roger Federer in straight sets, I'm never going to play tennis ever again. Yep. And I don't play tennis. <laughs> <laughs> but it would be an interesting match because I think you have two conflicting things. You've got age on one side, which I think will affect Hoyler a lot more. I mean, how old is he now? He's, I think, late 40s. 47, I believe. But, I know. Uh, the same but age? I, I, they're pretty close. I think Eddie's around 42 or 3. Okay. So they're both up there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and both of our... <laughs> both haven't been competing a lot mm -hmm. recently, so right. both are you know living the lifestyle, you know making music videos or yeah. funny YouTube videos or doing the seminar circuit. So I think it really comes down to who's been training more for the last ten years, like actual putting in training time as opposed to right. seminars or living the life or yeah. uh, hanging with Joe Rogan, <laughs> <laughs> appearing on podcasts, <laughs> having their own podcast. Yeah. Eddie uh, and, and Hoyler were at a press conference, and Eddie said something interesting. He said, um, you know, a lot of people think that it was a fluke that I beat Hoyler, and, and nine times out of ten, Hoyler would beat me. He said, I don't think that's true. I think six times out of ten, Hoyler would beat me. So he admits that the odds are probably on Hoyler's side. Uh, but then he goes on to say, you know, we don't know which the next one's going to be. You know, this could certainly be uh, Eddie's time. But uh, it's interesting that he accepts the fact that Hoyler has the edge. That yeah. one match could... Vault. I, I don't think there will ever have been as highly anticipated a matchup for in any of the Metamorphs events as that one. Yeah. So that's that's the dream fight. That's the yeah. George St. Pierre against Anderson Silva of so submission th grappling. This match is dependent on another Metamorphs event. So let me ask you this: What do you think are the chances of this Metamorphs event continuing? 
it's my theory is that you know, as we can tell, a lot of money is being put into this promotion, yeah. and I don't know if they're getting a return on, on that. But it could all be an attempt just to get it on TV. You know, right. When UFC got the Ultimate Fighter show, boom, the, the numbers skyrocketed, and that was the key to success. So I think they're hoping to get this on TV. Um, but after watching Metamorphs 2, <laughs> that's not what people want to see. That's not is, what the layman wants to see. Which is really, you know, it's, it's disappointing because we have um, – you know, we understand the mentality that they're looking for, the fighters that they're looking for, um, which is, you know, that, that that style that just goes after it. Um, I think, you know, if they continue to get more fighters like that, it could, you know, potentially just do like what you're saying is just get to that level where it's it's mainstream. Um, you know, Henner and, and the, the, the Jiu-Jitsu Academy, um, Gracie off of Torrance, they're now affiliated with UFC where they have UFC one-on-one, mm-hmm. which brings a whole new, you know, kind of perspective for, for that side of things. Yeah, and as we know, the uh, Fertitas uh, put a lot of money into the UFC for years and years and years and to get it to the point where it was profitable. Um, the question is, how long is uh, Zepps willing to uh, invest in Metamorphs, and will it ever be profitable? Well, I've been wrong about many, many things, and one of the things I was wrong about was the UFC surviving. I remember, you know, UFC 8 or 9 going, okay, this is it. It's dead now. Yeah. It's, it's, what are we, like UFC 500 now? It's not dead. But the success of the UFC also coincided, I think, with having uh, fights that a meathead, you know, could understand. Mm-hmm. Two guys standing there punching each other in the head. Yeah. And then, or when you did win by submission, you, saw, you started seeing guys apologizing for winning by submission. I'm sorry, I really wanted to beat him up, but I ended up Submitted. going for the choke. Sorry, fans. Like, <laughs> so, I, I here's what I think. I don't think the metamorphs. I love jujitsu. Yeah. I've been doing it very concertedly for a whole bunch of years. I don't think that Joe Sixpack is ever going to be able to understand why you and I would be lying on the ground hugging each other, you know, f- you know, face in the other person's private area, you know. But it's north south position. No, that's not what Joe Sixpack is ever going to see. Mm-hmm. Right. I, I think it's an uphill battle, and I think uh, judo hasn't hit the mainstream yet. They've been trying to promote that for years and years. I think it's much more exciting, personally. But the, uh, the fans who understand jiu-jitsu and appreciate jiu-jitsu is what's increasing. And I think that's one of the things that this event, and I think even just us as jiu-jitsu fighters, is trying to do for all of the the world is just really heighten what people understand as jiu-jitsu to help become them, help them become more educated. Of, of what exactly it is. People make lots of left-hand turns and they love NASCAR. So maybe as more yeah. people get into uh, get into grappling themselves, even yeah. in a couple of classes, they'll start enjoying stuff like Metamorph. I hope I'm wrong. Yeah, I think it, it, I agree with you, Stefan. I think it's an uphill climb to try to get the layman interested in watching jiu-jitsu competitions. But what we're seeing is an increase in jiu-jitsu practitioners. Mm-hmm. And if you're practicing, you know what's going on, then you can appreciate an event, uh, like, an this. event like that. And you know, AJ, you and I both belong to Gracie Baja. We've seen an explosive growth in Gracie Baja schools throughout the U.S., and right. uh, I rarely hear of one closing. So that means many more practitioners are, are coming to our sport. IBJF events are popping up all over the country and the world, and many times selling out a week or two before the deadline. And a hundred years ago, catch wrestling was big, and people came to tournaments to watch or came to events to watch three-hour main events. I think Frank got I mean, I'm going back in history, but not Carl Gotch, but Frank Gotch and Hackenschmidt, I think, they had one of their title matches was two and a half hours long wow. of essentially submission grappling. And people you know, came by the thousands to watch. So this, there is a precedent for this. Maybe you do just need a more educated audience. Right. So as we saw, Metamorphs dumping a ton of money into this, making it look beautiful. On the other end of that spectrum, there's another uh, promotion called Jiu-Jitsu Battle, and they just had their third event a couple weeks ago. It's held in, uh, well, this one was held in the Graffiti House in L.A. It's a beautiful venue with nice uh, graffiti art in it, and it caters to the lower belts, blue belts, purple belts, and brown belts. And everybody I talked to that went, including AJ, said it was an amazing day. Even guys that I know, even part of our crew that doesn't train, had a great time. They all loved it. It's amazing that they were able to do something so fun and so enjoyable on a very, very low budget. cost. Yeah. yeah, it was very, it was very exciting to be there. It was you know, an awesome event, and just like you said, it was it was done probably a, 
you know, 32 percent, you know, just really, really low percentage of, of cost compared to the Metamorphs. But it almost like everybody's talking about the Metamorphs, but then the Jiu Jitsu battle, and it's just like there was a lot of hype about the Jiu Jitsu battle, and everybody would seem to enjoy that more from a, from a, a um, you know, a spectator's point of view. Why, why did people enjoy it so much? I, I would think, you know, mainly because, you know, there's a few reasons that people could probably boil it down to, but I think one of the main reasons would be just the the backyard style of it, you know? It's not, it wasn't done on a super, you know, high production level. It was just done like almost like you're just, you know, outside hanging out with people and there's a, a battle going on. People are watching. Were they tournaments or was it a tournament? Or it was a tournament, it? Yep. Okay. It was So how was it different from a regular, any other tournament, including say the Mundials? There were points. Um, there were, there were no points and there the was... Finals. There were points in the finals? There was no points in the finals. And no time limit, right? Well, there were no points that were, like, given, like, okay, you passed the guard. There was just, like, the judges you saw in the metamorphs. It was a kind of a referee's decision. Um, and the finals, were they timed or was it uh, no time? The the finals were no time. Right. So that's very different than mm-hmm. an IBJF event. And, um, you know, you, you had your fair share, like, which was kind of, you know, from higher belt perspective you look at some of the lower belts you, you there were there were a good amount of some matches that we were kind of like you know just kind of staring at and watching people stuck in 50 50 but there were a lot of matches that were real, real really delivering for the spectator and um you know I, overall the event was awesome yeah well maybe we will figure this out one day there's enough little uh sub competitions now and different rule sets between abu dhabi the yeah. IBJJF. Metamoris, jiu-jitsu battles, submission-only tournaments. Maybe we will find a, a format that, yeah. on average, creates a more uh, exciting event. Who knows? Maybe Metamoris too did have the perfect rule set, and just by chance we got yeah there are four, a lot of variables. Four, three <laughs> or four crappy matches. You're you're always going to have crappy matches. Yeah. You know, you know, we can't count the number of times we've looked forward to either MMA matches. Oh, we're going to be awesome. And yeah. it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> That's right. Is this over yet? Yeah. So there was four uh, uh, tournaments at this jiu-jitsu battle. The first, let's, we're going to look at all four final matches. The first one was the blue belt lightweight final. Benji Silva versus Nick Bourbon. The nice thing about these lower belts is they don't have a big name, so they're putting it all on the line. That was nice. They're hoping to make their big name exactly. by putting it all on the line. Yeah. And it's fun to see the lower belts who are... Ooh, nice uh, try. <laughs> he turned right into the turn. Uh-oh. That's on. Yeah, if I remember, that's the end of it. Yeah, he's going to stand up. He still has control of that arm. And that's it. And AJ, who were some of the uh, coaches that were in attendance? Um, Cabrino was probably there. I did. I think I did see Cabrino there. Homolo wasn't there. I, he's, you know, Homolo Brahal recently is, is, you know, have, having a baby now. Yep. And he uh, just had his wedding, so that was pretty cool. Right. Um, but I, I can't remember all the. There were a lot of people there. Yeah. Next up is the purple belt lightweight final: Edwin Najmi and Silvio Duran. I just mentioned Edwin. He uh, well, mentioned uh, Homolo. Edwin on the right is a student of Homolo Hall, and uh, he's well known for his footlock. And there he is going for it. Impressive that Silvio is able to uh, withstand this. Edwin submits a lot of people with that. This was one of those matches that you you know was very long. Um, they were in the 50-50 position a very long time, and it was a, a no time limit match. Mm-hmm. So you, you know from from this you know. From this perspective, this is kind of where you look into the sport and, you you know, you think about, like what you had said, you know, what are some improvements that we can make um, to to not enable this kind of thing to happen? Um, because right now we're just kind of showing the highlights of the match, but for those of the people that were at the match, they really, you know, you can remember that this match was very long and it was stuck in one position, the 50-50, with both people attacking the ankle for a very long time, and it was, it was boring. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I know Edwin. He's a you know he's a friend of mine. I'm not attacking him as an athlete or any you know, the other athlete as well. It's just it's that style of jujitsu that's not becoming appealing to the eye of us and, and the eye of the spectator. Um, 
So I don't know, what do you, do you feel anything about maybe things, improvements that could be done or advice that can be given? <laughs> I think if, as a footlock guy, or as that being a big part of my game, I, I'm still up, too upset about the uh, leg reaping rule being added to the IBJJF competitions to, uh, to even begin to comment about the 50-50. It's crazy. If you're going to allow, you take a look at some of the, leg, the ways the legs get twisted around in the 50-50 guard, as guys are trying to pass, they're trying to sweep from it. It's infinitely more dangerous than a straight on ankle lock with, you know, reaping the leg. So. I hate that position. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be real, like, blunt. I hate it. <laughs> but you know what? I, I, don't, I think we, we shouldn't be too quick on banning positions. You know, we need to give people time to figure it out and, and yeah. work through it. I've seen a lot less stalling now than we did in maybe 2009 when the 50 50 started getting popular. Yeah. So. There's starting to be a lot more counters. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, Keenan Cornelius finished one of the Meow Brothers, not. Uh, the Mundials, but Pan I believe it's the Pan Ams with an arm bar mm -hmm. against it, which is pretty cool to watch. It's almost so, like there should be a, a time limit in that position. Could yeah, be. I like that idea. Next up is the Purple Belt Heavyweight Final. Wellington Lewis versus Hunter Ewald. How many people were in attendance? It's hard to tell. Oh, well, quite a few. Yeah, there's a good amount of people there. It, was just, it wasn't as, as large of an, a venue. That's a fast Omo Plata. It was pretty, uh, pretty packed. This was an exciting match to watch. And here we are in the 50-50. Yeah, but they didn't spend too much time in there. It was a pretty exciting match to watch, I rem what, from what I remember. Really cool art on the walls. It gives it such a different <laughs> uh, feel yeah. than your typical tournament. Yeah, that, so you had asked about you know, what was kind of different about this. Th that would be it, you know, just the atmosphere in, in general. There's a DJ there too, right? Yeah. <laughs> It's totally different. And the obligatory acai stand. <laughs> <laughs> nice back take there. Yeah. Sort of against the headlock. Yeah. Gracie mm -hmm. Basics 102. Mm -hmm. Nice job, Wellington. And the brown belt final of the heavyweight division was Paolo Miao versus Felipe Cesar Silva. Now, Felipe had already beat the uh, younger brother, Joao, and uh, met up with his brother in the final. This was a pretty action-packed match. What did they define as heavyweight? No, it wasn't heavyweight. This, there was only one brown belt division for this. Okay. But up to heavyweight, right? Up to heavyweight, Okay. Yeah. So you didn't have any 300-pounders in here? Right. Okay. Miao is, of course, uh, a big fan of the Barambolo, and it's exciting to see how guys are countering it. Yeah. I wouldn't call Paolo one-dimensional, because uh, he has good jiu-jitsu from everywhere, but he just prefers to do the Barambolo. Yeah. He had a very exciting match with a um, guy from Atos, uh, Jordan Schultz. Mm -hmm. In the first the first matchup with him, and um, you know they were they were battling each other out for probably about the first five five seven minutes, and then Paulo just put the heat on and and finished the match with a submission, and it was uh, pretty exciting to watch. Mm -hmm. I should mention that all these matches are available on Budo Videos four ninety five for the replay of the entire event. Yeah. Wow, that's a crazy choke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me sit on your head while I'm pulling your neck. You know, this is one of those things that, you know, a lower belt, so Paulo, everybody knows, won the, the Worlds at both his level and the absolute level. So I think he had total probably 10 matches. Yeah. And then the following weekend does this and has three. One, two, three, right? Yeah, one of them, no time limit. Three or four. And, you know... That's the kind of stuff that just is exciting because, yeah. you know, you, you go out there and you, you, you know, you know, granted there's, there's life that's involved with training jujitsu. You know, you have other things aside, you're not a full-time athlete. So some of those guys that are, are managing both, they may have a little bit more difficult time. But those of you guys that are full-time athletes that train jujitsu on a regular basis, two, three times a day that you devote your life to it, you know, th that's exciting to know that the guy like this guy, not even to mention he's one of the smaller guys in the division, but he... He just came off a, a, a you know, 10, 
10 match weekend following weekend then he comes in and does another tournament just like this with the competition just as intense mm -hmm. he fought jordan schultz first round second match i can't remember the guy he fought but it was it was super you know super tough and then he had this this final match it was submission only no time limit um and his style of fighting is it's it's, it's fun to watch mm -hmm. and yeah. I, I i would just encourage people that are, are getting more involved with the sport and, and going up and and going to more competitions is to 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 go at it with that mentality to think more along the lines of you know, it's it's just meant to have fun with it. Go out there, do your best, and and let everything else just shine. Don't be really so wrapped up in winning or um, you know gaining some trophy or some title because of it, and just be more involved with your mindset on how you know. Well, it'll take the pressure off as well. Yeah, they're, they're, and I mean, it's probably one of the single best things you can do to deal with nerves. I was always I haven't competed in years, but I was always a very nervous competitor. Except for the one year when I was competing a lot, I was com just, and I was competing a lot in jiu-jitsu, submission grappling, and also in a firefighter event, like a firefighter combat challenge. And it just became another day at the office a little bit, and you didn't have, you did have the adrenaline dump, yeah. but it wasn't, you were a little bit used to it, and maybe you'd have a little bit less of an adrenaline dump, and it became a little bit more like, oh, well, what am I doing today? Oh, yeah, yeah, there's a competition. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm way over-exaggerating it. Of course I was nervous. Yeah. But it wasn't as crippling nerves that I had initially. So just doing it more often. And I, I, how often does uh, uh, do the, are these guys competing? Right. I mean, yeah, all the time. Yeah, all yeah. the time. Like yeah, every tournament, they're there. Yeah. So maybe that is the key. And, and it's not like boxing, where you're going to be, you know, where you shouldn't be fighting after getting a concussion. Right. Hopefully, you're not going to get too severely banged up at a jiu-jitsu tournament. It's possible, of course. Even as you get older, you know, it's it's still something because it's just the, you know, the purity of the sport it enables you to be able to do something like that. A good example would be Shanji. You know, he, I think last year, he had just came off the, it was this Master and Seniors Worlds. Then he did the um, the Pro League and then the Metamorphs. Am I right? Is it Was it that order? I think so. It was something where it was three weekends in a row, at, you know, a high level competition. And, you know, he's not in his 20s anymore. He's in his 30s, which, you know, just respecting the purity of the sport and, and enables people to be out that with that that kind of mentality um so that's yeah that's awesome another awesome. guy who competes a lot is uh, gary tonin gary fought uh joao meow at, at the jiu-jitsu battle and it was a super close match the judges couldn't decide who won so they went an extra five minutes and ended up giving it to joao but it was super close and gary thought that it, it, it didn't go his way he wanted a rematch so uh he uh he challenged Joao Miao, or actually Paulo Miao, and um, well, he did an interview for buddhasport.com. Let's check it out. Okay, so 15 minute match, submission only, and your match actually went into a five minute overtime yeah. because it was so close the judges couldn't uh, score it either way, and mm -hmm. um, Joao ended up winning a very, very close decision. So, do you want to talk? To us a little bit about that match. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it ended up being, like you said, a split decision, two judges to one um, for him. And uh, like fighting in the match, like myself, just like my own self awareness of the match, like uh, of what I know. Like afterwards, you know, I'm f like fully healthy right now, and was immediately after the match. Like I could have went again if I wanted to. Another 15 minutes, I would have been fine. I, I have no injuries. Uh, didn't get submitted with, or like didn't have my arm popped, or like my you know, my ankles popped or anything like that, like no, you know, on his part, no submissions like that. Um, also never got my back taken or my guard passed, um, which more importantly, the guard, or more importantly, the, the back taken from the Baron Bolo, I, I feel that, you know, I feel that he's never going to be able to take my back during the entire match and, and still wouldn't be able to to this day if we competed against one another. Um, so I was, I was happy that I, I was able to to achieve that and and uh, to be able to put him in so many compromising submissions, um, I popped his ankles on several different occasions. Um, you know, it was tough for him to walk at the end of the fight. He had a swollen ankle, uh, possibly both. I'm not sure. I don't know if I hurt his knee in the calf slicer. It's a possibility. Um, but you know, I think in terms of like a submission only event, I think I, I personally feel that I I, uh, I did very well. Uh, I'm not going to take anything away from him or uh, the judges in terms of the decision, you know, it's over. Like at first I was very bitter, um, but you know, that, that happened already and I'm not so, I'm not so uh, concerned with that anymore. Um, but 
you know, uh, moving forward, I now know that I have a, a type of game, at least in a submission-only style, where I can compete against both of those guys. You know, they have a very similar games, Joe Allen and Paul. We want to answer. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of people, you know, uh, are talking about it. I, I mean, it, it was really just something that I wanted to offer to them. Um, you know, I understand why it's exciting to the public. I do. I'm not going to deny that, you know, um, of course it's going to draw attention. But um, that was definitely not my intention what, in any way whatsoever. Um, it's, it's really like, you know, like I said, a personal challenge and just to show everybody that, you know, that, you know, that Baron Bolo, you know, can't be your only, you know, your only attack. So, um, a couple questions that I was asked, um, in response to this challenge, uh, just, you know, based, you know, for the rules and for what's going on. So here's what it is. Uh, if you haven't seen it yet, what I, what I put out there, uh, basically I said that I would offer up a thousand dollars of my own money against the thousand that Paulo won in Jiu Jitsu Battle 3. Um, that I would fight both of them, no time limit submission only, back to back with 15 minutes break in between, um, and submit both of them. And uh, if either one of them submits me, you know, you know, the first one I fight, whatever the case may be, they win. You know, 100%. Um, I still would like to fight the second one afterwards, even if something like that does happen. I don't anticipate that, but uh, if it did happen, I would fight both of them regardless, just for the sake of competition and for you know the you know venue or whatever the case may be. All right, Gary, uh, pretty cool for putting it on the line like that and, and rematching not Joel, but Paulo, the champ. Yeah. Yep. Do you think he has a chance? Gary has a very, very unique, um, you know, style of jiu-jitsu, which is, it's, it's very respectable. You know, he's very cardiovascular-wise, just super high on that, on that, that totem pole, and, um, he has a an awesome awareness of submissions. He, you know, he attacks at a lot of different angles. Um, I had spoke with Gary. You know, I was at the event and I had spoke with Gary kind of after, and I could tell he was really upset about um, kind of the outcome of that match. It seemed like he was more concerned. Which he, you know, he had told me he, he was more concerned, not concerned, but more enthusiastic about being able to fight it in this jujitsu battle versus the world's. Um, yeah, I, you know. He was more excited about, I guess, that style of fighting, or more excited about being able to compete about some of the guys that were on the uh, the list of competitors. Um, so he was tra his his training was more geared toward toward this competition versus it being. I'm sure he you know he cared about the the world championship, but he was more excited about this. Um, so you could tell he had a lot of emotions built up into this match. And when you watch the match, it was originally 15 minutes, and um, he. The, the rules were at the end of 15 minutes, it would be a, a, a decision, you know, if a submission's not been had, it would be a, a, a just a, a judge decision. And the match was so close um, back and forth, you know, a lot of the times that the, the judges kind of, you know, the crowd, you know, procrast you know just kind of uh, threw out, uh, rematch, more mm -hmm. five minutes, mm -hmm. 15 more minutes, this, mm -hmm. that, let's go, let's go. Um, you know, J uh, Juan was throwing up his hands like, yes. Uh, Gary was, you know, come on, let's go, let's go. So they added another five minutes. They just decided it on the spot. They just decided on the spot. And um, the same thing, it went back and forth even more. It was really close. And then the judges gave the decision to Juan. And I think, you know, that was what was very disappointing for, for Gary. Um, maybe one, that he didn't get the submission. And two, that it, it didn't go his way. Um, he didn't get to advance and have more fights, obviously. Um, but the 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 call out after, um, and I had I had asked. I said, well, what do you feel about if they if they had made the the decision to to just not add five more minutes of overtime and they had just left it at the decision of the first fifteen minutes? And he had said, oh, I feel like they would have still kept Juan as the winner. Um, but if you watch the match, it was it was interesting because. Gary put a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of submissions on Juan, and he, he actually had some of the the, the Victor Estima footlocks that are not so noticeable when you, you you see the position happening. He has you know the ankle cranking; it's really 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 tough. And um, you know you saw Juan stumbling a lot in the match, but um, he had said that you know w whether the decision was made the first 15 minutes, he still feels like they kind of had the decision to make Juan the the winner. But the remaining five minutes, the adding the five minutes, was pretty exciting to watch. Um, but I think that's what upset him to kind of to to push for a rematch. And 
he had told me that he originally was just talking with a friend about, you know, if, if you know, the, the Meow Brothers want to come at me and they want to do a, another one, I'll be more than happy to do it. And then he just was thinking about it and it's just like, you know what, I'll, I'll tell him, I'm like, you know, I'll put your, I'll put up my own thousand dollars and against your thousand dollars that you want and I'll do a rematch with you, not only with you, but a submission only, no time limit and I'll 15 minutes break and I'll fight your brother. <laughs> and I think he was just kind of heated in the moment and he just was like, you know, you know, just excited for what was going on, but right. well, these are guys are competitors. Yeah, yep, meaning they're they competitive. Yeah, and in the heat of the moment, in a close decision, you know, maybe there should be a, a cooling off period <laughs> before they issue challenges. On the other hand, it's pretty exciting for the sport. Absolutely, yeah, people shooting their mouth off spontaneously. So it, it uh, from it's probably a good thing for the sport. From what I understand, the uh, re- the rem- oh, I shouldn't call it a rematch because it's Gary's now going to fight Paulo Miao, not Joao Miao. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. But uh, that's going to happen at the next Jiu-Jitsu battle, Jiu-Jitsu battle 4. Um, no date set yet for that, but as soon as we know, we'll let you guys know. Okay, guys, don't go anywhere. We're going to be right back and talk about some new promotions, some new products, and some other stuff. My name is Majid Hage the fourth. This is my dad, Majid Hage the third. I've been doing the baseball choke for about 10 years now, and all the adults would always smash me in my guard. So this judo guy showed me this choke where I set up my grips, and every time they passed, they would get choked out. It works phenomenal if you have difficulty with the guard. Every tournament I do, I get the choke at least one time. A lot of people have gotten promoted lately, and as you guys know, if you're a regular viewer of the show, we like to give shout outs for brand new black belts. So uh, with no further ado, first uh, guy that got promoted to black belt recently is Philip Siegel. Got promoted by Fabio Holanda. Next up was James Chiarello. He got his black belt from Phil Migalaris, as well as Steve Plyer, Ronnie West, and Aldo Sahibi. Next up, Jerbo Nerni got his black belt from Vander Braga. Dave Marinakis got his black belt from Cam Rowe and John Will. The next name is uh, one that uh, viewers of the world might recognize, Kit Dale. He had an amazing match with uh, Keenan Cornelius at the Worlds. Um, probably Keenan's uh, toughest match of the Worlds was his very first one against Kit Dale. He's the guy on the right, one of Australia's top grapplers just got his black belt. It's going to be exciting to see him in the black belt division. He got it from uh, Lucas Leitch. Next up, Paul Zietler got his black belt from Armando Basulto and David Adiv. Next up, Doug Sparks, Josh Treffrey, and Jimmy Quinlan got their their black belts from Patrick Barberi and Nate Ross. And finally, a name that's not unfamiliar with AJ Agazarm, regular competitor Sinistro got his black belt. He's the one second to the left. So it's going to be exciting to see him mixing it up, and I'm sure we're going to see some wars between him and AJ again. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Okay, guys, let's talk about some new products. A few new things to talk about this week. Um, The Nogi Velux Rash Guard just came out. This one's available in short sleeve and long sleeve. Fully sublimated, so there's no uh, cracking or peeling. Um, AJ, you picked up one of these the other day. What did you think of it? It dries really quickly. 
Yeah. Super awesome because you know you, you in in nogi you get really sweaty pretty pretty easily, and um, a lot of times if you have other rash guards it, it's soaking wet and then you put it in your car you put it in your bag and you're like, this is retarded. Mm-hmm. Um, but this you know even when I wash it it just dries super quickly which was really cool and then the feel and the fit of it I one of my favorite rash guards I wear right now, um, so I'm excited about that one. Cool. Next up, um, one of the best gi brands, Tatami Fightwear, came out with their popular Estilo line. Uh, this is the, the fourth version of it, the Estilo 4.0. It's available in white, navy blue, and royal blue, and black. People always ask me what my favorite gis are, and you know, it's a personal choice. Everybody fits differently in different gis, there's different cuts, different shrinkages, all those factors. But uh, for me, Shoei Roll and Tatami are two brands that fit me very well and are very well constructed. All of these are available on BudoVideos.com right now. Next up, um, we have a product from Stefan Kesting. This is your fighting a bigger, faster, (laughs) stronger opponent. The topic of today's training is how to deal with, how to avoid getting crushed by, and ultimately defeating a bigger, stronger, heavier opponent. So the first thing that you want to look at when you engage with your partner is how your relationship with them is and whether they have physical control of you or you have physical control of them. We need to have this battle. This is the most important thing. Hand underneath, hand through the armpit, so I have head and arm control and it's palm to palm. So once I get here, I keep my head down. I want to pop up to my toes and bring this leg all the way around. So I'm using my foot against his his thigh, and I want to pop that leg out, and I want to go to the mount, making sure I pull this arm out, and I base, so I have a great position. When your partner begins to come in and defend, your bottom hand is going to go and intercept their grips, right? You're going to think about intercepting their grips. And from here, you're going to be able to pull their arms a little bit tighter. So, Stefan, very uh, unique content there. What uh, motivated you to, to make that? Because you're a big guy. You obviously don't have much trouble fighting bigger guys, do you? <laughs> well, it, I try to answer as much of my own email as I can. And uh, it's, getting less in, it's getting more more hard to do that as I get more emails from my website. But and one of the website most, is? GrappleArts.com. And one of the most common questions I get asked or I got asked all the time was, Stefan, there's this dude in my class who's 50 pounds heavier than me, and I'm 40 years old, and this is some 25-year-old weightlifting punk, and he's had some wrestling, what do I do? And I've got answers that work for me, but it's a little bit, um, I don't really have a lot of uh, reputability in that area, being a bigger guy, being 215 pounds. So I thought about it and I decided to work with a couple smaller grapplers with Emily Kwok, who I've known for 10 years. She trained with us a long time ago before she moved to New York. And Brandon Mullins, who you actually introduced me to, which was uh, fantastic. And Emily was just really good at essentially reverse engineering Marcelo Garcia's game. And when you think of Marcelo Garcia fighting bigger guys in Abu Dhabi, tapping out Rico Rodriguez, who was twice as big as he was. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's one thing to be able to teach and it's another thing to be able to break down someone's game. And not to say that Marcelo isn't a great teacher, but Emily's a really good interpreter of his game as well. And Brandon has got much more of the uh, uh, Gracie Baja style approach and is also a really well-rounded competitor, different body type. So I really enjoyed working with both those guys to help answer that. And the dirty little secret is, even big guys, I'll take, say, take myself as a reasonably big guy, are worried about the, the much bigger guys. When I show up at class and there's a 250-pound guy or a 270-pound guy, I've rolled with three and 400-pound guys. That's, you know, I've been doing this a long time. I'm pretty big. Uh, at times, I've been in great shape, and that's still a little bit of a reality check and an adrenaline dump, you know, like, oh, my God, I've got to roll with this monster. <laughs> so if I feel that way, <laughs> imagine that a lot of other people feel that way. Yeah. So the material that Brandon and Emily have shown in these three sets so far has really helped me dealing with larger guys. And the dirty little secret is I've also used it on smaller guys because smaller people, on average, the stereotype is they're more technical. That's certainly most often true. So if you can start using techniques for fighting bigger guys on smaller people, again, this is just between you and I, uh, (laughs) it it works really well too. 
Very cool. I should mention that these are all available on BuddhaVideos.com on DVD and as of today, also available on demand. Okay, last uh, new product to talk about. I mentioned it earlier, but the Jiu-Jitsu Battle, uh, number three, is entirely available on demand on BuddhaVideos.com. $4.95. You get to see all the matches. <laughs> So Five bucks for all that. <laughs> that'll keep you busy. It's pretty good. And it's not just entertainment, it's educational. You can learn a lot from watching, guys. So study up. Okay, last thing before we go to the mats, uh, let's take a look at a viewer email. Brad Bellini writes, I'm just starting jiu-jitsu and I want some supplemental training. Do you recommend books or DVDs? And I'll get some quick comments from you guys, but I'll just say uh, quickly, uh, I'd hardly recommend both. Um, books, not so much for technique. Personally, I find it a little bit hard to learn techniques from books. Um, techniques on DVD or whatever online training is great. Um, but books are more, I study more like interviews and uh, history of the art and things like that. Um, sure. I think if you're a serious student, you got to know uh, the history of the art. Uh, there's some good books on that. Um, Plenty of stuff out there, but uh, for techniques, I learn better from DVDs. But of course, you got to train regularly. It doesn't matter if you sit at home and watch all the DVDs in the world. If you don't go out there and, and uh, learn from a teacher, you're not going to improve. Um, and also, I should mention, uh, shows like Rolled Up uh, are also ways that you can hopefully be entertained and also learn something. AJ? Yeah, like you said, just to coincide, it's, there's nothing that replaces you know the training that you have on the mat. Um, you know, I'm sure you know as well. It's... Uh, it's great to have those tools like the books and the DVDs and the, the you know the those different types of things that aid to just I think it's on the mat training that really you know it probably enhances everything you know so I'll, I'll try and take that and, and run with it a little bit I actually think if you're one of those lucky people who can train two or three times a day five or six days a week basically no job the full-on jiu-jitsu lifestyle you're probably not going to get that much from the occasional book or DVD you're not going to get as much as some schmo <laughs> who's working a real job has kids you know has a mortgage is lucky to train two or three times a week the guys who are training all the time are going to have access probably they'll be at a really competitive school they'll have access to you know they'll be breaking down the latest match okay uh paulo miao at the latest uh yeah. you know jiu-jitsu battle you know he changed his barimbolo to go from here to there the re regular guys aren't going to be able to take that level of time. So I actually think that instructional media, in whatever form, becomes much more important for you know, regular practitioners. I've learned an point. awful lot from books and videos, both. I've got a ton of books. I think it, a lot depends on learning style, whether you're, yep. they're both visual learning styles, but maybe you can subdivide, you know, there's kinesthetic, there's uh, audio, there's visual-based learning. Maybe you can subdivide visual-based learning into books and videos. And I, I really gravitate towards books. But obviously, I've learned a lot from videos as well. That's a very good point. Very good. All right. Um, last thing, I want to give a shout out to Bill at Q5. Happy 45th birthday. and Keep training hard. Uh, so we're going to go to the mats now, and um, we're going to talk about leg locks. So uh, don't go anywhere. I want to show you. Uh, one, each of us are going to show some kind of leg lock on the mats. So we'll see you soon. <laughs> 